Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back uh, for the last session of the day. We are delighted to have this uh, panel of uh, top leaders in their field uh, discussing today um, a topic which is intrinsic to the whole uh, NPL picture, which is um, servicing. Um, servicing has taken on uh, many different forms, and no doubt there will be some challenges um, brought on by the ongoing uh, health crisis. So we, we look forward to hearing the, the perspectives and viewpoints of our speakers today. So our moderator today is Richard Bevan from Deloitte. Thank you, Richard, for, for handling the, uh, the discussion. Much appreciated. And um, I'll pass it over to you to introduce the rest of your panel. Martin, um, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and, and welcome to everyone. So um, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, DDC panel discussion on the Greek overseeing market. Um, as Martin said, my name is Richard Bevan. Um, I'm a director within the portfolio lead advisory team at Deloitte. Our team focused primarily around non-core and non-performing loan transactions, including portfolio carve-outs, working with banks and private equity funds, as well as end-to-end -end advisory services. While our recent focus post the GFC has primarily been in Europe, We've also been people based in Asia and South America providing global coverage to our clients. And we've been involved in one capacity or another in all of the secured and platform transactions in Greece over the last few years. Let me quickly introduce the panelists before going into the discussion. And I'm delighted to be joined today by, first of all, Antonius Bias. Antonius is Managing Director of EOS Matrix Greece. EOS has been active in Greece for several years with two business sectors as an education entity and as a servicer. Antonius is also a board member for the Hellenic Association of Debt Management Companies, or ESADA. ESADA was set up in 2005 as an industry body for debt management companies to promote best practice amongst members and aids with government to assist in developing the conditions necessary for the normal operations of the debt management market in Greece. And Antonius is speaking to us today in his ESSA capacity and will give the association's perspective on developments in the market and what the association is doing to support on servicing. Minas Athanasides is the country manager of APS Recovery in Greece. APS first started operations in Greece in 2018 as a servicer to a Euro 2.3 billion nominal value retail portfolio acquired by a pool of international investors, including APS from Piraeus Bank. Minas has extensive banking and advisory experience, spanning origination to restructuring and liquidation. He's managerial and board positions in Serbia, Greece, and Germany with EU and US banks. And next, I'd like to introduce Theodore Soros, Theodore has over 20 years experience in MPLs and servicing. Since October 2019, he's headed the corporate shipping and recovery team at Interim Hellas. And prior to this, he had roles at Perea Bank as general manager of corporate recovery and as a director in the IB team at the National Bank of Greece with a number of key roles in landmark transactions and privatizations, as well as prior to that being a senior member in the BM project finance teams of Eurobank, as well as at Deloitte in the UK. Theodore is an FCA and holds an MSc and BSc in accounting and finance from the London School of Economics. And finally, but certainly by no means least, um, I'd like to introduce Hugo Velez. Hugo is general manager of Hippogis, responsible for the company's platforms across Spain, Portugal, and Greece. Before joining Hippogis, Hugo was director of asset management at White Asset Solutions, which was a Lehman Brothers company. He's been working in the non-performing loan sector since 2004. And during this period, Hugo participated in more than 20 different buy side and sell side transactions of assets portfolios in Portugal with several international investors specializing in risk assets. Hugo holds a bachelor's degree in business management from the university ISEG in Portugal. So welcome very much, gentlemen. Um, great to have you here. Um, and let's uh, kick off uh, the discussion. 
Um, so as a start point, I mean, Greece has been amongst, if not the most uh, NPR markets uh, in Europe over the last couple of years, with the initial focus around NPR portfolio sales, and more recently transactions focused on platform carve-outs and under the HAP structure. That said, and with the onset of the current crises, it seems that the NPE cleanup in Greece is never ending. Now, Theodore, maybe I start with you. I mean, during the last few months, Intram has completed a number of transactions within the Hercules securitizations framework. What were the key lessons learned and what challenges lie ahead, do you think? Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation and the opportunity to participate uh, in this interesting panel. As you correctly said, in June, the last nine months, we have been able uh, to finalize 7 billion of Hercules transactions, Project Phoenix and Vega. We're now finalizing Project Sunrise, which is 7 billion transaction with uh, Piraeus Bank, and we're actively pursuing Project Frontier of National Bank of Greece, which is another 7 billion transaction. So I think we have a very good understanding of the challenges and the key takeaways from the scheme uh, from our participation in these projects. First of all, I would like to say that Hercules has been a great success. Undoubtedly, you know, it has been uh, a success in the market. The Greek banks have reduced the non-performing exposures from 65 billion in the beginning of 2020 to almost 40 billion at the end of 2020. And we're expecting that by the end of 2021, the MPS, the MPS are going to be less than 10 billion. So it's a great success. However, I would like to state that the MPL problem in Greece has not been resolved just because we're transferring the MPLs from the balance sheet of the banks to the securitization vehicles in Ireland. The problem still remains. And uh, within the next years, the securitization vehicles will undertake their own to proceed with major a number of significant volume of restructuring, but also auctions, and effectively through the auctions to transfer the real estate assets, the collaterals, to the Rioco companies, which are going to set up, which are going to be owned by the securitization vehicles. And these Rioco companies will effectively be responsible for the monetization of the collateral. So effectively, all this period, we have transferred the collateral from the banks to the Irish SPVs and then to the Rioco companies that they will undertake the monetization. So the NPL issue in Greece has not been resolved, that should be clear. The second uh, takeaway is that these transactions have been designed in a way to maximize the senior nodes for the banks. Why? In order to, to, to minimize the losses that are going to incur. This implies that the valuation for the mess nodes, which are actually acquired by the third party investor, is rather limited. And most of the value is sitting on the servicing contracts accompanying the, most, the mesh nodes rather than, rather than the valuation of the mesh nodes. That's why the transactions we have seen in Greece, uh, the valuation ranges something between two to three times the annual interest. Another remark in the concern, in my opinion, is that uh, the securitization plans, they have been based on quite aggressive plans in order to support the senior nodes of the banks. And these plans, they assume significant volume of auction within the next couple of years. So my personal concern, and I'm quite skeptical, is to what extent the Greek judicial system, or the notaries, and the whole infrastructure, infrastructure will be able to accommodate significant volume of auctions within 2022, 2023. Uh, I have, you know, specific concerns, and I have to say that my, you know, uh, my concerns are getting more intense, take into account that in the last year, the auctions and the legal actions in Greece have been freezed due to the COVID issue. So the business plans have been to, to a great extent affected by this freeze of auctions. So I think uh, the discussion now is to what extent uh, the protection period that is, is, is provided by the state for these securitization schemes, which is 24 months, can be extended to 36 months. That's a very important discussion we're having with the services and the banks are currently having with the government. And the last note uh, from my side is that because of the challenging business plans and because of the penalties 
and posed to the servicer and the mesh holders when they missed the business plans. I expect that in 2022, 2023, many services and investors will proceed to aggressive portfolio sales in order to accelerate collections in their securitization packages and avoid the penalties. So I'm expecting to see the development of a secondary, of an active secondary MPL market in Greece and uh, something which is not clear evident currently in the Greek market. Thank you. Theodore, that's very interesting. And we're going to come to some of those questions, I think, in a, in a bit. Um, just bringing um, Hugo in. Hugo, from, from, from your perspective, what, what challenges are you seeing in today's economic environment and how are services adapted to them? Yeah, um, so good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the, the invitation and uh, to be present in this panel. So um, regarding the, the challenges, so I would say the following. The first thing is, of course, that the pandemic situation and the COVID uh, situation has been challenging, even if we start from the um, as a service managing SMEs and corporates. Why? Because the, the number of uh, insolvencies uh, around the, the companies, but by one hand, the number of restrictions on uh, activities of several industries, uh, which some of them even move to really um, uh, a stop of, uh, of their activity and some others, that's why they move to bankruptcy, is being quite challenging as a service. Uh, and of course, needs to affect your performance. And if we think on the individuals uh, where the moratoriums are more applied to, to, to this segment, uh, we all know that um, the, the end of the moratoriums is going to accelerate the defaults and is going to create for sure uh, new stocks of NPLs. So clearly this was, this was and it is still uh, a challenge. Apart from that, aside from that, uh, like Tudor was saying, like uh, in Greece, we have lived with a situation that was extended to other countries, the suspension of activity of auctions uh, and even the evictions. Of course, that we know wh where, uh, where we are in this industry and now it is important sometimes to accelerate the pipeline of, uh, of uh, our REOs uh, and the importance of having the auction even for pressure on the borrower side. Uh, that of course is another thing that is a challenge and is affecting the, the performance. Saying this, I think these difficulties for a servicer is more a question of how you adapt to, to those different situations. And I think um, the servicers, which they are in fact asset management, asset management and portfolio managers, they need to, to act quite fast. And I think what we did, for example, was to, to basically see that this is coming. We know how the pandemic situation is coming. What could you do? Well, you could start seeing like identifying and segmenting and uh, clear the portfolio on who are cooperative and who are not and being cooperative uh, if you could help him like uh, on uh, restructuring and uh, modifying a bit the loan, uh, give some grace periods on that because you, you know that the guy has conditions to, to come again to you uh, and, uh, and basically repay later. That is one. But the second thing is for cooperative or not cooperative, but for the ones that are at least uh, interested in solving the situations, of course, that you, when you move to a crisis situation, you probably need to accelerate the real, the real estate angle. So you need to work with him to accelerate the repossession of that asset. And of course, you end up on the, on, the, on the ones that do not cooperate with you and you need to focus on the auctions. But when you say, ah, but the auctions are sus suspended. Yes, the auctions are suspended, but not the, the entire judicial process. So you need to start moving the shift from your legal managers to basically push as much as possible the legal phases until auction that when they reopen, you are basically with a big chunk of, the, of your portfolio on that phase. Uh, so I think like I just tried to give practical examples of the challenge that we face, that we face as a servicer, like as uh, what happened in the market and what type of solutions you need to, to adapt and be flexible. Uh, and is what a bit what uh, we, we have been doing uh, in, the, in the last month, fortunately now, Everyone is more positive and we are all, all hoping that the turnaround and the recovery is just starting. Yeah? 
Thank you, Hugo. Um, Minas, do you want to come in on any of those points? And what's your what's been uh, your experience? Uh, in essence, I I subscribe to everything uh, Hugo said. Uh, first of all, the the uh, economic distress, which is actually a, a, a prolongation of the of the debt crisis, uh, uh, enhanced and, and and boosted also uh, by the uh, recession, uh, uh, the pandemic recession. Of course, this has uh, uh, this has uh, brought new protective measures for the for the debtors. No doubt about that. But this has also uh, created some fatigue, uh, reasonably so, on behalf of the debtors, because uh, uh, at, at some point, of course, this is this is uh, this is a situation where uh, uh, the responsiveness of the debtors uh, has reduced uh, more broken promises uh, to pay uh, more. Um, uh, let's say. Um, uh, uh, lack of responsiveness to 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 to, to calls and, and, and everything. That's all understandable within the context of this prolonged economic distress situation. Now, um, uh, of course, this triggers or this 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 results uh, to uh, a uh, slower recovery, which. Uh, uh, is 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 a, a, a problematic issue for the investors at the end of the day, obviously, uh, the slower pace of recovery. Now, um, further challenges, I would like to, I mean, from my perspective, I consider even the adaptation to the new bankruptcy law. Uh, no doubt there are merits to this new law and even the uh, what, what Hugo referred to the suspension of, of, of auctions uh, was for some reason attributed, attributed to the need of creating a new economic, new uh, legal environment for protecting certain class, certain, certain debtors, and then uh, move on with the, uh, with, 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 the, with the auctions, no doubt about that. So the adaptation to the new reality of the Greek insolvency law is a challenge. It will take a while. Uh, it, it, it will call for a change in the operational workflow of, of the uh, recovery teams. And of course, uh, the effects of the provisions for personal bankruptcy, this is also uh, to be assessed. Uh, it's, it's, it's a new element, especially for those servicers engaging in retail portfolios, especially the unsecured portfolios. Now, um, uh, further challenges that have not been resolved so far from the practical perspective of the um, servicers are, we still have an incomplete uh, uh, land registry. It's still works in progress. That's essential. Uh, we, um, uh, well, uh, we do have uh, a very restrictive legal framework when it comes to servicing companies. Uh, how often they, 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 they are allowed to, to place calls, et cetera, et cetera. These are issues that, that, that you know, that uh, persist. Uh, GDPR restrictions, finding the right person to, to talk to. The biggest problem for a servicer is to have the right person contact having the right person at least saying, hi, uh, I, I want to think about it. Now, uh, adaptation measures or adaptation strategy. Of course, uh, servicers to some extent had to revisit uh, collection targets uh, to, to adapt their recovery strategy. Uh, they resorted to portfolio segregations. As Hugo said, um, uh, the protected population, the protected perimeters, the, um, uh, the unwilling uh, perimeters, like non-protected yet unwilling, and so on and so forth. Then uh, services had to be resourceful uh, regarding uh, campaigns, uh, a mix of tools, uh, of discounts, debt reliefs, prolonged payment terms. 
uh, the approach to some perimeters was more customized to some perimeters of debtors based on the analysis of the individual track record. Uh, going forward, the use of mediation, the, uh, the um, how should I put it, the more frequent use of, of mediation tools might also be a response to, that, to the challenges uh, uh, services are facing. And last but not least, the use of uh, pre-legal and legal actions. Uh, this is the last resort for, uh, for collecting, of course. Thank you. Minas, that's, that's really in insightful. I, I feel that it's perhaps um, the right time to bring Antonios in uh, and get a slightly different perspective perhaps from him in terms of what the association is doing to help services with these challenges. Good afternoon also from my side. Uh, the Greek Association of the Debt Collection Agencies uh, was established in 2005. As we speak, uh, there are nine members and uh, in total we have a capacity of more than 1,000 people and the capability to make more than 400,000 contacts or calls uh, per day. Uh, the entities of the association, I mean the members, uh, Historically, it was the contact chain between initially the banks or the services we can say right now and the debtors. Uh, all over these years, we managed to adapt the market changes and modify our business uh, based on the banks, funds or services, recently needs and debtor reactions. Uh, we are operating, it's, it's very important to be aware that we are operating under a specific law, the law 3758 of uh, 2009, uh, which is very restrictive, sensitive, and uh, preferable to the debtors. Our target as an association is to develop and empower the legal framework, the enactment of rules and regulations of the management of contracts and complaints, and the continued training of employees and executive of its members. Uh, we are also a member of the FENCA, the, Federal, uh, the Federation of European National Collection Association, representing the industry on the European level by coordinating and participating on several roundtables. And the key activities of the FENCA is to set up and continuously improve business standards and good practices within the sector across the European Union. Our main support as a, is, has to do with the asset classes of consumer loan and mortgages. We also provide services for more SMEs, but the main volumes are on the asset classes that I was referring to. The entities of the association has a long history and it's always an arm from the banks initially and funds and the services later on. Just, uh, I would now like to give you an example that presents totally our ability to adapt the market changes and reactions and provide efficient services. Uh, in the beginning, if we go back on March uh, 2020, when it was the beginning of the pandemic crisis of COVID-19, there was a huge discussion about how we will communicate with the debtors and if we have to communicate with the debtors due to COVID-19. After several negotiation discussions with the state, mainly by the Services Association, we end up that we have to contact the debtors and maintain the culture of payment because otherwise, if we suddenly have a stop of payment, it will be a disaster for the economy. Uh, although the financial effect of the COVID was huge for many consumers, and the states and the banks were also was obligated to support them and find a solution. Uh, the solution was to freeze the payment in case uh, the debtor was uh, consumer was negative, negatively affected by the COVID. Uh, at this stage, uh, there was uh, a huge demand from the market to support uh, this action. I can say, allow me to say that this in one night, but actually in a week, we changed our model from debt collection agencies uh, to customer service oriented entities to support the consumers that were affected uh, by the COVID. Instead of communicating about their debts, we are starting communicating with a completely new approach more customer service oriented, 
And during these communications, we managed to arrange all the necessary processes in order for the TEPTO to use the advantage of freezing the payments without any future issue. Uh, at the same time, we have to also uh, pay, take an attention that we are contacting at the same time debtors that were not affected by the COVID. In these cases, we follow the previous approach, a little bit different, but the outcome is that simultaneously we create and implement two approaches and that presents our capability and our flexibility to the needs of a service, depending on the market uh, uh, conditions. Uh, I believe that this is the best example that proves our ability to adapt the strategy of a servicer and modify our communications in an effective manner. Uh, th th thanks very much, um, um, Antonius. I, I mean, staying with you, perhaps, if I may, for the, for the next question, we, we heard uh, from a number of the panelists already um, around the challenges faced as a result of the suspension of property auctions until I think it's the 1st of June. Right. Should we expect uh, a rush of foreclosure to close the gap on portfolio recoveries? Will the courts be able to cope? I think, uh, I think that was raised as a, uh, as a possible question in terms of the demand. And Antonius, what would be your thoughts from the association's perspective about those questions and about how, as you were just talking about, debtors are protected um, with the lifting of, uh, of these various protections? Uh, with a market with an NPL ratio before the securitization, 25%, uh, all the legal, uh, we have to proceed with several actions uh, that will have all the decreased the NPL ratio. Uh, under these circumstances and due to the pandemic, the actions have already been delayed. Uh, we are all aware that the debts cannot be evaporized. We have to find a way to clean the market from his debts in order for the banks to start financing again. Uh, the debtors were protected uh, a lot uh, for many years now. And I can say that we were, they were overprotected in several cases uh, due to the market situation, which is normal. And that was one of the main reasons that initially we have seen uh, high rates of strategic defaulter, defaulters in the Greek market. Uh, what I can say for sure, what I believe is that all the debtors that they are willing to pay uh, the, with all the solution that the services can provide right now, they can definitely find a solution and avoid the auction of their house. Uh, the protection for those that they need it is proven. Uh, we have, the, as an example, the last protection uh, for the people that were affected by the COVID uh, with a solution from uh, the program Yefira Bridge, uh, which was reached uh, an amount of up to 90% for their monthly placement for their monthly payment. That was uh, the last protection measure that uh, uh, they get from the state. Uh, to, actually, the debtors are not protected anymore. Uh, but at the same time, they do have plenty of time to react and find an amicable solution. Uh, under this, I'm expecting to see an improvement of the recoveries, or the recoveries in general, since the debtors will understand that there's no protection anymore without any serious reason that can prove it. For those that they can prove their issue and their willingness to pay, I'm pretty confident that the service will be in position to find a very good solution for all of them. Thanks, uh, thanks, Antonius. That's 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 good to hear. Um, and Theodore, um, from your perspective, b before joining Intram, you um, headed the corporate recovery department in Piraeus Bank. Do you see any major changes in recovery strategies adopted by the services compared to the previous situation? And, and do you think we should expect more uh, aggressive uh, actions within the next few years? Thanks, Richard. Look, uh, definitely we're going to see uh, some changes in the recovery strategies for, uh, in my opinion, two main reasons. The first one is that in the previous years, we have to appreciate that the banks tried to clean their NPL portfolios, uh, taking into consideration their provisions and the potential implications to their capital. 
And this has been a burden when we had to do aggressive restructuring and provide significant debt forgiveness. When a portfolio, when a loan portfolio is sold uh, to an investor, to a third party investor, or is uh, securitized through a hub transaction, effectively the loan is revalued at its true economic value, right? And as we have uh, seen and have read from the press announcement from, from the bank, from the banks, all the major securitization transactions have been realized with significant billions of cost, right? And further provisions from the banks. So now the new owners have effectively bought the portfolios at their real intrinsic values. And I think this will allow them to make, you know, this will provide them a further flexibility in their decision-making process. They don't have to consider if they have enough provisions or not to, to make, you know, uh, aggressive solutions. That's the first issue. The second is that I think uh, the targets of the investors and the banks were not identical. Today, the third party investors are looking for cash collection. They're trying to maximize cash collections, uh, take into account their internal rates of return. The banks, they had to reduce NPEs, non performing exposures. Cash collection and reducing non performing exposures is not identical. The non performing exposures can be performed, you know, can be reduced through restructurings, auctions, yes, but also through curings. So in the past, the banks have tried have many significant efforts to undertake a number of restructurings in order to make, in order for the loans to be cured from non-performing exposures to performing exposures. So they can be classified as back in the performing group and also generate an interest income for the bank. This aim is not applicable for the services and the investors. The only thing they are looking is cash collection. And on this perspective, I think that the recovery strategies are more focused on cash collection. And for this reason, in my opinion, they will try to intensify efforts for DPOs, for refinancing of viable customers for third parties, and of course, to increase the options. And the third element, which applies mostly to the big restructuring, uh, to the big corporate restructuring cases, is that you have to appreciate that the major Greek systemic banks, they have been operating under extensive scrutiny from the local authorities and judicial authorities. Uh, I had many colleagues and, uh, many, and personal also experience that when we had uh, undertaken a major restructuring case and we had to provide debt forgiveness, we may had questions from the local uh, judicial authorities or the from local prosecutors, why we did a forgiveness to this client, right? And this was a barrier, and we had to be very careful and hesitant how to approach difficult cases. And for this reason, sometimes we didn't take the necessary decisions. We just extend and pretend the problem and wait for someone else to take the shit. I think now this issue does not exist in the securitization vehicles, does not exist with the uh, third-party third investors that acquire these portfolios. So again, I expect for this reason to see another shift to more aggressive restructuring solutions, more aggressive haircuts. Nevertheless, I have to mention that uh, the servicers and the investors still approach you know, recoveries with an element of social responsibility. Uh, we are very careful how we approach vulnerable households, vulnerable customers, and this is evident through the extensive moratoria measures that we have provided in the last years. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Theodore, that's that's really uh, really insightful and, and, and interesting, um, particularly in terms of your your sort of comments around the social responsibility bit there. Um, I mean, as bringing you in here, perhaps, how do you see services responding, and and what can services do to help borrowers? And perhaps we're speaking specifically about good borrowers, you know, who, to improve on their upon their performance. Well, as a, as a general uh, uh, idea, of course, servicers are very sensitive to and synced with the overall economic environment because this determines to a great deal 
the, the ability and the willingness of the borrowers, the debtors to pay. Uh, it's within the spirit and the pursuits of the new law anyway, the new law uh, for insolvency, to promote viable solutions for debtors, individuals and companies alike in a consensual manner with restructuring tools, transparency of data and fair treat treatment. It is, I mean, notwithstanding all the very correct points that Theodore uh, mentioned, uh, I believe there is a shift of paradigm or uh, th there should be a shift of paradigm going forward because it's in the best interest of servicers, medium term, to broaden the recovery base of their portfolio in a sustainable fashion. Meaning that servicers should be open to applying their best judgment and help preserve what's best to be preserved and be an active, responsive stakeholder in the platforms, for instance, of the Special Secretariat of uh, Management of Private Debt. Um, on the other hand, services can no doubt benefit from the faster and simplified court proceedings if an execution, liquidation for that matter, is the preferable option. Technology is going to play a significant role here, along with a redesigning of the work processes within the organization of uh, each borrower. This is pretty much uh, concluding uh, what I think uh, the response should be. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Mina. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, um, we, we, we have a couple of, well, one, one more topic um, specifically we want to touch on. But I did just want to say to the audience listening, um, do um, please submit your um, questions through to, to, to the chat platform. And then if we're able to, we'll get to them as well. Um, so that's moving on. Um, we've talked about adaptability um, and flexibility. Um, Hugo, could we perhaps just think about what operational changes, what technological innovations are being employed uh, to aid the recovery in each of the sort of key asset classes uh, as we seek to exit the pandemic era. Hugo, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I think we, uh, we, we need to, to think about it again. Like uh, I will come back again on the starting of the pandemic situation. As any other company, and I believe in any other industry or most of them, everyone had to adapt immediately uh, on the teleworking solutions. That, that is one part that is more infrastructure solution. And I believe that in general, from the comments that I got from the competition and from clients, I think it was uh, a good surprise in general from, from the companies, specifically in our industry, that people have moved out totally from the office and starting working from home in a question of days. Uh, at least it was our experience, but from, from what I understand from the market and the different players, it was not really an issue. But this has an effect, independently that your um, infrastructure solution works well. Um, like office environment, teams dynamic, uh, how you organize uh, your teams that, uh, for example, us, we work with, uh, with teams with a, 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 a servicer integrated solution where you have the asset manager, legal manager, real estate managers in the same uh, group with the same client. And now they, they work in a, a totally different dynamic, you know? So I think that effect, uh, it is important. And when I speak about office environment, I'm not saying that I defend teleworking or office environment, but this industry in general, as people need to work um, uh, near, and there is a lot of negotiation, even the buzz that you need and the energy for negotiation, is being affected. So for sure, this is a number of challenges uh, that people ha had faced and have a very short time to, to adapt it. So I think that was one of the impacts, let's say operational changes that, uh, that happened. The same way that, um, 
for example, we are uh, our core is more the secured assets, and of course, it, this involves traveling. Uh, as soon as you have several more restrictions to travel, you need to to find solutions uh, to adapt to that situation. And uh, uh, for example, I think it obliges everyone to start using even more external providers, outsourcing certain activities, because as soon as you have more restriction to traveling from your people, you need to have someone that replace your 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 uh, your team uh, on those different places. So. I think there was a number of uh, operational changes that uh, I'm saying just look uh, linked to the, the teleworking because it's true that uh, in, in, in a question of one week, you basically need, need to adapt all these workflows and these, all, all these operational um, uh, day to day that we never think that they are so implemented that only when it happens a situation like that, it makes you think again on that. So that is on the operational side. When you move more to your question about the technology, I don't think that the, the pandemic situation uh, has changed or uh, have, uh, have created something. Like I think we, are, we were uh, in this type of conferences and we know this industry has been changed from the last 10 years and investing several uh, thousands of euros uh, in technology. And uh, we all talk about systems, asset management solutions, integrated system. Uh, in nowadays, for example, we have started investing from three years ago on external portals where our borrowers and our providers work directly there and they are 100% linked to, to our system. So there was a number of uh, tools and technology being in place that didn't stop or that the COVID or the pandemic situation uh, changes for a, for a certain time of different technology. What I believe is that you have the, the need to accelerate some of the, the developments that you had in pipeline because, of course, again, some limitations of doing the work physically, let's say, uh, oblige you to push even more for your technology plan in the sense of accelerating uh, a big part of these um, of these projects that you had in place, and as I was saying, like these who, who didn't have like an integrated platform from A to Z had to develop. Fortunately, we have. Uh, we were already improving on having portals that link to our system, to our real estate brokers, to our general providers, and even to our borrowers. And we 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 just uh, saw that now even we need to accelerate, accelerate or improve even more the solution because uh, you have restrictions to do the job physically. So I would say that the pandemic situation didn't change the technology side, probably put more pressure on, on, on your technology plan, let's say. Hmm. I mean, I, I, it is remarkable actually to think about how business have been able to adapt. I don't know what would have happened if this had, you know, happened 15 years or so ago. Um, and, but I think, you know, from my perspective, I don't know, the in terms of, Hugo, you mentioned sort of necessity being the mother of invention. Um, we're going to see a lot of acceleration, of, well, a lot of acceleration that perhaps. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Theodore, I'd like to turn to you. Um, I mean, how do you see the, the the servicing market developing over the next sort of two or three years? I think currently there are 20 services active in the Greek market. Um, what do you foresee as being the changes, um, accepting that no one has a crystal ball, but what's your view on that? Thanks, Richard. Uh, I think currently we experience a high number of services in the Greek market, some of them without meaningful activity. And in my opinion, uh, this is not sustainable in the medium to long term, and there are going to have uh, developments within the next two to three years. First of all, we have the three mega services, let's call them, uh, which is the uh, interim to value supply, but currently they are rather busy with their finalizing their internal transformations and uh, completing the big securitization uh, projects with their uh, relevant banks, which is going to take the full 2021. 
I think that uh, after they have completed their uh, the securitizations, the next step uh, for this mega service is that we try to gain my market share. And uh, potentially they will squeeze out the smaller players. So taking also leverage of their significant volume of operations and the economies of scale they can enjoy. I think that in this environment, the Greek market, in order to be able to survive and have some meaningful profitability, either you have to be a very cost efficient servicer, or you have to be a specialized servicer that's going to provide high value adding services, either in a very specific setting, such as uh, big corporates, uh, UTP, shipping, something like this. Uh, and I think that uh, the next game will be who will manage to become a very efficient, cost efficient servicer. And on this issue, uh, it's, uh, it's going to require significant capex. We need capex for IT, collection systems, uh, automation procedures, uh, setting up uh, state of the art. Call centers, and also very important to set up a very strong real estate team, which is going to be able to liquidate the collateral and manage the collateral through the auctions. So, uh, in my opinion, you know, you need heavy capex in order to be cost efficient, and of course, in order to commit to such capex, you must have scale in the market. Otherwise, you cannot really justify this level of uh, of capex. So as a conclusion, I would say that uh, the next day for the servicers in the Greek market, the next two, three years will be about uh, cost efficiency and lean operations. Thanks. Thank you very much, Theodore. Um, staying, staying with the topic, really, I suppose, Minas, uh, looking at the servicing market in the round, what are your views on the role of services in, in Greece going forward? Well, um, Richard, for sure, services will continue to deal with uh, uh, problematic exposures, NPEs. Uh, NPEs will not stop. Uh, there will be a new production. But in my view, services, the services role will gradually shift from, let's say, being the the, the, the crisis man management stakeholder, the agents of doom initially, they will gradually uh, evolve into becoming systemic loans administration service providers. There are first signs for that. Uh, there, the sale of, uh, of restructured bank loans is in the plans of banks. I believe that loan perimeters of current loan exposures will follow. Services may or will, not all of them, but those willing, develop, no doubt, and this is what Theodore said as well, I subscribe to that, specialization skills for particular asset classes, I mean, energy or shipping or whatever, yes, indeed, and will also contribute to the further IT development of, of, of platforms with more of a decision tree artificial intelligence uh, features. That's, that's, that's the future. So uh, I also subscribe to um, the need of uh, uh, conducting lean and efficient operations, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, in the, in the old days, we were saying, uh, because I'm, I'm coming from the banking sector originally, uh, we had too many people in, in the banking sector, we had too many banks, uh, it all evolved into the, the current situation. Now, there is also a lot of staff uh, employed with, uh, with servicers. Uh, not all of this staff uh, uh, may be... Uh, qualifying going forward for this lean uh, structure, efficiency, productivity uh, among the, uh, the, the, the workforce uh, will have to be uh, the, the, the theme of the next uh, years, probably. This is pretty much what I think. That's 
where I think, see things going, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hugo, do you, do you have a perspective on that? Or indeed on, on Theodore's uh, previous comments around the development of, of consolidation of the market? Hugo, can you hear us? You're, you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Uh, no, I, I, um, like it's not a question that I, I disagree. I, I, it is more a question that um, I think is too soon to speak about um, that type of consolidation or that type of trend, because what you have today is basically like um, uh, a, a Greek market composed by mega services, uh, and there are a few uh, like us that uh, are just just starting to get assets under management but there is a lot of need in the market even if you want to 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 bring a strong competition as spain as an example as italy uh the funds to come the credit funds such funds will need to have more independent services because they could not just work with their own competitors that that own these mega mega platforms so I think for now there is a need in the, la in the servicing landscape to clear, create even more services or they, the, these ones outside the, the carve-outs needs to, to grow. Uh, and only after that, uh, for sure, some uh, consolidation will come. Because when we speak about these 20 services, let's be clear, and I think it's clear to all, that not all of them are really active as, for example, us and, and a few others. Huh? So we need to have this in mind. So I think it will happen by the trend that we have, but later. I think Greece is a very uh, similar market on the way that was created uh, as Spain that started with these mega services, jumbo deals owned by a number of uh, respectable investors uh, that own those platforms. But, uh, but uh, it uh, grew to a situation that you need more providers outside these bigger ones and captive services, because if you really want to bring the competition, let's say, to have 10 guys bidding a portfolio, they need to have servicing. They need to, to have in the market servicing capability. So I think that come later, not, 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 not exactly now. Okay, that's, 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 that's interesting. Um, uh, we, we, have getting, we are getting uh, some questions in, so thank you very much. Um, but before sort of moving to those, perhaps, um, Antonius, I, I could ask you for your view from the you know, association's perspective, um, perhaps as to how you think um, services should evolve um, to reflect the, the current em environment. Uh, after all the statements from the previous gentlemen, it's a little bit difficult to say something. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, will try. I don't know if I have something innovative, I will try. Uh, from the point of view, the services has already been reflected to the current environment. Uh, since it's been mentioned before, we already have an initial segmentation. Uh, as I said, we have three types of services. We have the big, the big players uh, that were created during the car with the carve-outs. Uh, another type of services is the funds that they enter the green market with acquisition mainly on uh, the NPL, the unsecured uh, portfolios, which at the same time create local entities for servicing their own portfolios. And uh, we have the rest uh, of, if I can say, which are mainly uh, small vehicles uh, with a niche uh, position. Uh, it was normal in one of uh, the biggest uh, market in the Europe uh, to receive and to see so big interest on the servicing. Uh, but as the market is, uh, move, as the market is moving forward, uh, besides the needs for CAPEX and, uh, uh, and uh, whatever, all the other issues that they already been mentioned, uh, we're expecting to see a consolidation and uh, maybe some merges uh, or acquisition, uh, which is normal as soon as the market will uh, mature. Uh, although I hope that uh, I think uh, Hugo said that we need more services. I hope that we'll have more uh, and everybody will have a future, a fruitful future and uh, reach their targets. 
<laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, well, thank you for that, that, those comments. So um, we've had some um, uh, questions in from the uh, audience, which the panelists, I think, can see. Um, I hope they can. Uh, uh, for the benefit of the audience, I'll read out those questions. So, <clears throat> and then perhaps turn to the panelists, whoever wants to ask them, answer them, I should say. So the first question from um, uh, Demetrius, um, how do you see activity in single ticket corporate SME transactions from the portfolios currently managed developing? Um, how is the approach different in terms of securitized portfolios versus acquired? And are there operating businesses in these port those portfolios or mainly real estate collaterals? Um, so who wants to have a go with that one? Um, Theodore, uh, would you want to have a chance? Okay. Yeah. Okay, first to say that uh, most of the, the most of the securitizations that have realized today, they relate to mortgages and rather small loans or corporate loans that have been denounced. So the recovery story is more likely liquidation and recovery of the real estate. So we don't have many operating businesses in those portfolios, uh, but we have some. The recovery approach, obviously, it's, it's a standard we have, uh, you know, but we have to compare what is the recoverability if the, if the business continues as a going concern and what is the recoverability if we try to liquidate the collateral. Uh, Regarding the activity in the single ticket corporate SME transactions, uh, I think it's rather limited. We haven't seen many uh, sale of single name exposures in the Greek market. Uh, there were a couple that were, you know, uh, we had some interest but related to real estate transactions. But if you deviate from the real estate spectrum and you go to most to, to other industries, as for example, in the steel sector, Recently, there was an acquisition of uh, loans from uh, MBG and Tapiros uh, regarding a steel uh, processing uh, player. There was only one bid, right? On when we tried to sell the loans of a uh, healthcare group, we had two bids. So uh, the single ticket uh, transactions, I think they uh, require uh, investors and services that have a specific appetite for the industry segment. And it's more like private equity business so you must understand this industry you must you must be ready to invest in the sector rather than MPL management thank you very much thank you um i don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that or um should we move to the the, the next question sorry no okay let's let's move to the to the next question this is from um alexander rockas um is it only the servicer or also the owner of the claims who decides on the strategy to be followed with regard to a specific debtor? And is the servicer obliged to follow the owner's proposals? Um, I, I don't could, know. Uh, I could go okay. for that one. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, like uh, I think like in general, the servicer needs to follow the instructions of the, the owner of the claims, I'd say. Uh, even if it is in a securitization transaction, or even in a, a pure true sale transaction. Uh, of course, that saying these, yes, the services need to follow the instructions of the, of the investor, but depends a lot, a lot with who, who you work. There are certain investors um, that are very demanding on asset management and they spend a lot of money on asset management, which means that the servicer has uh, considerable um, controls by them and they are basically very near your teams. And so basically you really follow that instruction almost in the day to day. This is one type of investor that really invests on asset management. So basically the servicer is an extension of this solution, let's say. Uh, and there are the others that commonly come more from the small and medium funds that basically as they have smaller size, they need to get comfort and to, to trust, let's say, um, to trust like uh, much more than the others in the sense that a lot of independence will be attributed 
to the servicer because the guy doesn't have like 10 guys to be in the platform basically tracking and controlling the work of the servicer. In those cases, independently that they give instructions, the common way to, to, to work is that you get levels of independence to basically take your decision and some, uh, some proposals. In any case, even with these small funds that I'm trying to say that they could be more flexible uh, in order to give you more independence as a servicer, commonly you need to agree a certain strategy uh, for the portfolio, uh, certain type of decisions uh, on what is the steps that you need to follow. And finally, as I was saying, independence on levels for, for, for approving disposals or even expenses, because it's not only disposals that you need to have independence to do, to do your job, let's say. Hugo, thank you very much. Um, we, we are at time now. Um, so what I wanted to do was just, first of all, to thank the, the four of you, uh, Minas, Antonius, Theodore and Hugo, for your contribution uh, this afternoon. I've, I've certainly found it very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And I'm sure and I hope that I, our audience have, have as well. Um, thank you uh, from me uh, to DDC to, for asking me to host this. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure to do so today. So thank you for that, um, Martin. And um, I'll, I'll pass back to you now. I'm sure we're gonna have a busy couple of years uh, at the very least, so thank you. No doubt, Richard. Th gentlemen, thank you very much from all of us here. Uh, on behalf of the audience as well. Uh, great discussion, very insightful, and um, look forward to, to perhaps meeting in person uh, in the coming months. So, uh, Thank you, Martin. so all the best, and to our audience, please uh, join us for the last day uh, of the uh, summit tomorrow. We have some couple of great panels, uh, mediation and uh, the investment uh, focus. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Martin. Thank you so Goodbye. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.